Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to talk, this is episode number 132. All right, and I'm, I'm taping on September 19, 2013. Uh, this is episode, um, the title of this episode is like Unfree Will Integration Strategies, and it's going to be about how like, it's not just enough to know that we have a free will. I mean, like, if we just know that and it doesn't change us or it doesn't change the world and doesn't really mean much, you know, but like to the extent that we learn how to just apply this understanding to our lives, we can make our personal lives much, much better and the world much, much better and that'd be good. All right, um, this, I did this episode originally like in early August and but like, you know, a few of the episodes were lost, whatever, so like, you know, um, I'm still labeling it 132 even though it's taped after 130, five, six, and seven, whatever, so like, you know, it's no big deal. All right, um, so, all right, now, um, as I usually, you know, all right, I wanted to change the format. Um, ordinarily, I go through, like, why this show, show is important, and um, the definition of free will, and I refer you free will and stuff, but like, I'm going to do this, this, this is like, this is the nature of free will, this thought just came to me, I, I thought about it before, and, um, but I had these outlines already written, so I didn't write them in there. But like, anyway, what I want to do is before I go into that, uh, I want to just describe how, you know, overcoming the illusion of free will is beneficial to us. I mean, like, basically, like, when we hold a free will belief and things go wrong, you know, if other people do things that we dislike or think are wrong or hurtful, whatever, you know, with free will belief, we, we become angry. Okay, fine. We might be angry regardless, but we direct our anger toward them right? And that, that is the problem, because when we direct our anger toward a person, you know, that, that is absolutely not responsible for, that they couldn't have done otherwise, whatever they did, doesn't matter. Um, that, that is not only just really, really delusional, because that's what it is, but it creates problems. I mean, like, you know, like, um, the world could be much, much better if we overcame this delusion. And the same, th same thing, like, a lot of times we do things that are wrong, you know, because, like, we are imperfect. I mean, like, you know, according to, to some religions, we're, like, you know, we're tainted with original sin. We can't but do wrong, you know? So, like, that, should tell, that alone should tell you to have free will, right? You know, if you're destined, you know, even the Bible says this, if you're destined to make mistakes, you can't but make mistakes, you know? You can't be perfect, all right? So, anyway, so, like, yeah, so... You know, I'm, 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 I'm starting the show in this way with the hope that when you get an understanding of the harm the free will belief does and the, uh, the benefits of overcoming it, then maybe it'll make it easier for you to understand and accept the rest of what I'm going to say. All right. So, um, all right. So, yeah, as I, again, I, I want to do this because it's important. What, what people mean when they, have, when they say that we have free will is that like, you know, what we do is up to us. There's nothing or no one that's not in our control, and control is the key, okay? Control is the salient, essential key, all right? People say that like, you know, we can choose to feel, think, say what we do without anything that's not in our control, taking part in our decisions or actually making them for us. Because that's what's really happen, happens. I mean, like, we think that we make decisions on our own. That's this free will illusion. But what really happens is, like, well, the causal past, if you want to see it one way, or the unconscious, or the hedonic imperative, or the moral imperative, you know, or, or our nature and nurture. You know, there are various ways of see, to see why we don't have free will. But, but essentially, the idea is, like, you know, we, we may think that stuff is up to us, but absolutely nothing is. Okay, how big is this? This is really, 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 really big. I mean, it couldn't be bigger. There's this guy, John Searle. He was, um, they did a survey in 2010 of the philosophers throughout the world that were born after 1900, okay? And they ranked them in, in terms of like how often their work was cited by other philosophers in their papers and books and all that. So this guy, John Searle, an American philosopher, he was ranked number 13. He was tied for 13. Some other guy, I don't know what his name is. But, you know, this guy isn't just a regular philosopher. So, he was like being interviewed for a book in 2005, or that was published in 2005, 
by an Ameri by British psychologist, Susan Blackmore, who published a book called Con Conversations on Consciousness. And in that book, um, for that book, she asked John Searle, you know, like, if, if the world would come to understand and acknowledge that free will is an illusion, what would that mean? You know, open-ended question. Okay, Searle says, you know, and I'm quoting, I'm quoting from the book, but I, hopefully I get it right. I may not get the order right. Searle said, like, that would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Galileo or Newton or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe, end quote. Okay, um, this is big. Now, what's also big is, like, you would think, well, Searle doesn't believe we have free will, and so, like, he's kind of, like, touting the importance of his work. No, what's interesting to understand is Searle believes that we have free will. You know, he, he gets that wrong, but he understands the importance. Okay. So, all right, be, before we get on with these, like, very important unfree will integration strategies, how we can apply this in our life, I just want to briefly just explain in five different ways why free will is impossible. Um, when you think of how reality works, to my mind, there's only five conceptual possibilities. You know, one of them is, is, is the way it is, okay? But then, like, the four others, it came, they came to people's minds. They, they said, well, maybe reality works like this. When you think about it, it doesn't. But the key for this show is that even if reality worked in those other four ways, that wouldn't help free will either. In other words, all five possible mechanistic... Uh, explanations of how the world works refute free will. All right, so the first is causality. Okay, causality, that means everything has a cause. So what happens, and th the key to understanding this is like, if everything has a cause, all right, no, no, the, the other part of this is that like, that um, a cause, because you got to understand this, I mean like, there's two components to this is that you need to understand to understand why it refutes free will. The first is that everything has a cause, okay? And we're accepting this. Some of these, these other four mechanisms that I'm going to explain later are going to say, no, not everything has a cause, but we'll deal with them, and we'll, we'll, we'll also explain how that doesn't give you free will anyhow. But I think the, the strongest reality is that everything has a cause, okay? Um, now, with causality, it's like, it's also called cause and effect. So there's a cause, and then there's effect. Now, the idea, the, the, the second very important part of this is the cause can never come after the effect. That's why it's called cause and effect. You know, a cause causes the effect. Now, what happens then, like, the effect becomes actually the cause of the next effect. And that effect becomes the cause of the next effect. That's why it's called the chain of cause and effect. Okay, so what happens is, like, start at the Big Bang, okay? You have the Big Bang causing the state of the universe of the next moment, the state of the universe of the next moment, causing the state of the universe of the next moment. So what I'm trying to explain is like, all right, it's a chain of cause and effect. You can like understand it going forward in time from the Big Bang, but you can also understand it going backward in time from anything we do, any decision we make, any motion we do, anything. All right, so here's, so here's the thing. You make a decision, you say something, you feel something, you move something, you do anything, okay? That has a cause, because again, nothing happens without a cause, okay? And so this cause is happening before you do what you do, okay? So, like, then whatever caused you to do what you do, and, like, in terms of our physiology, it's like the, the, the neurobiology, these neurons and stuff, you know, they, they operate causally, you know? So anyway, so, like, whatever is causing you to do what you do has a cause also, but that cause is going to come before it, okay? So, and that cause of the cause is going to have a cause that comes before it. So can you notice how we're going back in time, moment by moment, cause by cause? Okay, so like what happens, this chain of cause and effect regressing back in time, you know, just spans back to before we were born, before the universe created, you know, all that. All right, so that explains very clearly why free will is impossible. All right. Some people say this. I'm not sure we're going to get to these integration strategies. That's all right, because this is important. Um, we will, but we won't spend that much time on it. 
second possible, some people say, no, not everything is caused. I'm sorry, you know, like, there's, there's like, there's quantum mechanics, you know, like, and at that level, things aren't happening that are uncaused. That's not really true. That's not really accurate. You know, even at the quantum level, things are caused. But let's, for the sake of argument, give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say some things were to happen uncaused. I don't even know what that means. You know, like, something's happening, what? Without a universe existing before it happened, you know, like, it's, it's incoherent to begin with, but let's, let's assume that things happen uncaused. Can, can that help free will? No. Why? Because like something that is uncaused cannot be caused by a human being, cannot be caused by a human being's will, obviously cannot be caused by a human being's free will. Okay? So, so you, in other words, if you refute causality, if you try to refute causality with a causality, the, the prospect of things are uncaused, that's not going to help free will. All right, so some people say, well, you know, there's this, there's this statement in, in philosophy called causa sui, okay, the cause of itself. Um, some people claim that, well, you want to know something? What we do, our actions, our decisions, our choices, our feelings, cause themselves, you know, they cause themselves, um, and that's where free will <laughs> resides. Um, but think about it. I mean, like, think, just think of what the statement is, okay? A decision is causing itself. Itself is the key word there. That's the operative word. If the decision is call, causing itself, we're not causing it. Um, to better understand this, a lot of times free will is related to the issue of morality. In other words, like people want to believe in free will so they can hold others responsible and so they can hold themselves responsible for the good and bad that we do, whatever. But, you know, like what happens is like if we're making any moral decision, it's going to be based, based on a moral principle or precept or learning or, you know, something. It's going to be based on some kind of moral justification. So, so then, so like, if it's not based on that, if it's not caused by that, because that would be a cause. In other words, like our moral character, our moral understanding, our moral learning would be a cause for us to like do something or not do something morally. If, you're, if we're saying that our decision is causing itself, it's not being caused by a moral precept, then you can understand that even through that understanding, that's not going to help free will. Okay, like, you know, if a decision is causing itself, just as in the case of an uncaused decision, it cannot be caused by a human being because it's causing itself and a decision is not a human being. And it cannot be caused by human beings' will, again, because a decision is causing itself or a movement is causing itself. It's not being caused by the will and obviously can't be caused by uh, free will. All right. So there's a, um, so we've gotten three um, down. There's a fourth potential, theoretically potential, but, you know, not really coherent possibility of, of, of a mechanism of how reality works fundamentally, whatever, because you'll, you'll, you'll understand that they can't work, you know, some things can't be like uncaused or random whilst things are, are random or, or <laughs> cause or whatever. But anyway, that, that's, that, that, um, that, would be, that would take a bit of time to explain. All right, so like the fourth mechanism is retrocausality. There's some interesting experiments in parapsychology and in some other fields where like Apparently, what's happening in the future is affecting what's happening in the present. Okay, and I'm not going to take the time to either like agree with or dispute the, the fact that this may happen because it's inconsequential to our question. In other words, like if the future is causing the present to happen, in other words, like, and, and you, you'll understand how absurd it is to begin, to begin with. Like, so you have the past causing the, the present and the future causing the present doesn't seem to work, but anyway, so like, but if the future were able to cause the present, you'd have this causal chain of event just coming from the future and from the, instead of the past. Again, you have things that happened after you were dead, after, after the planet no longer existed, after the sun burnt out and all, and who knows what happens then. You would have all that stuff, 
you know, retro causing what's happening now. All right, again, it doesn't give you free will. And the last potential theoretical mechanistic prospect for how reality works is some people say that like things happen ex nihilo. Ex nihilo means out of nothing, from nothing. Again, this is the same thing as like uncaused. If something is happening from nothing, we people are not nothing. We people are people. <laughs> you know, we're people. We're things. We're you know made of atoms and stuff. So like so obviously our wills aren't nothing and our free wills aren't nothing. So so that anyway. So like five ways. Five, you know, and I don't think there's any others. There may be, but like you know, if I find out about one, I'll bring them into the shows and refute them also. All right. So let's let's get into this. So um, okay. So the idea is like yet. Yeah, Intellectually understanding, as I hope you do now, that free will is impossible, that we don't have free will, isn't enough if you don't put it into practice. It's kind of like, you know, yeah, fine, so what? Because, like, in other words, like, the only way this has utility to us, to ourselves, to others, to the world, is putting it into practice. So I'm going to go, you know, for the next 11 minutes, I'm going to, like, just briefly, briefly talk about that. Okay, um, so some basic pr principles that, that we got to, like, adhere to while we're doing this. One, there's a difference between a reason for something happening and an excuse. In other words, like, you can't like, do wrong toward people and then just offer as an excuse, listen, I'm sorry, I don't have free will, you know, blame the universe, blame God, it's not my fault. That doesn't work because that, that shows a lack of compassion, a lack, lack of consideration, a lack of you know, concern for the other people's feelings and for morality. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't morality, I'm saying that there isn't fundamental personal morality. All right, so like we still want to do what's right and good for each other and for ourselves because, well, essentially because we're hardwired to do that, because like we're hedonic creatures, we seek pleasure and avoid pain, and we're also driven by this moral imperative to do what's good, even though we, we don't do what's good all the time because I don't know what, you know, whatever. So anyway, so like basically you don't want to use this as an excuse, all right, to do wrong. Um, second point is like, it's going to take years, if not decades, for everybody to get on board with this. I mean, like with evolution, evolution, there was a lot of hard empirical evidence to support it. With this, interestingly, there's, there's never been one instance of, of a physical phenomena scientifically demonstrated to be uncaused. Okay, so like the evidence for against free will, the empirical scientific evidence against free will, is far more voluminous and robust than the evidence for evolution. But nonetheless, it, you know, it took some time for people to accept evolution. And even now, like, I don't know how many years it's been, like probably over 150 years since Darwin introduced it. You know, here in the United States, 50% of Americans still don't accept it because it contradicts the Bible. We'll get into other sh you know, shows, that kind of theme, like in other shows, whatever, about like, the Bible's perspective and all. But um, so anyway, so like what I'm trying to say is that like you don't have to wait for the entire world to get this, which may again take years or decades to benefit from it and to have your friends and people that you're around, whatever, to have you benefit. I mean, to the extent you put these principles in your life, you're going to benefit. You're going to be less angry at people. They're going to be, you know, to the extent you teach them and help them understand they don't have free will, they'll be less angry at you. And that'll make things much better. That doesn't mean that we won't address the, the wrong or hurtful or whatever things that we do to each other, but we'll address it without this unnecessary blame. Okay. So, another basic principle is like, what does this integration, what is the fundamental integration strategy for an unfree will? It couldn't be easier. You just remind yourself. You just remind yourself anything, anytime something's happening, anytime you read something, you hear something that somebody says to you that, that you find unpleasant or hurtful or whatever, you remind yourself, wait a minute. That person had to do with it. It wasn't up to him. It, you know, you might, want, you might get angry, okay? You might, you know, feel, wow, you know, I wish it didn't happen. But you're not directing that anger and that disappointment, that frustration, whatever, toward the person. Um, it takes practice. It takes practice. It's not like, I'm not saying like you, you just remind yourself and all of a sudden everything's changed because we've been so thoroughly conditioned in this free will perspective that it's going to take years to fully overcome it. You know, I've been working on this for like, I've, I've understood that the free will is an illusion for decades. I've, I've been working on this, you know, pretty consistently for 
at least three years. And, you know, I'm still far from, far from perfect, far from very good at it. I mean, like, it's tough. It's tough, especially, especially tough living within a world where all the institutions, you know, kind of like affirm free will or condition for free will. But, that, you know, that'll change. Okay. Um, so that, 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 the point, though, is that the slightest degree of, 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 um, of progress you make with this, you know, each time you remind yourself you're driving and somebody, like, does something, you know, like, you know, fine, you, you don't get angry at the person. You get angry maybe at God or at the universe. But, like, you know, I think it's better. For me, it certainly feels better to not get angry at people. Because, like, with God, I mean, I don't have many conversations with God. God you know, God is, like, <laughs> I don't know where he is, you know. <laughs> but, but, like, people are around us all the time. And people, we influence other people's lives and they influence our lives, you know, much more directly. So, so it's very important to, to kind of preserve and maintain our positive regard and relationships with people. Okay. So, all right, so how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to put this into practice? Um, first, we want to ad- identify blame situations. Let's work with blame, okay? Because this, you know, Overcoming free will helps us also to not be arrogant, to not be envious, and not to feel guilty. But the same principle applies. You know, we're just not ascribing fundamental agency to anyone. All right. So, so let's say one, one of the things we can do is like we read a newspaper, and like if you read the New York Post or the Daily News, they will like demonize people. You know, people will commit crimes, and they'll just like, you know, sometimes the, um, I, I, I read a, um, I read a, a headline some time ago. The headline in big letters, New York Daily News, I think. Maybe New York Post, I don't know. Rot in hell. You know, I mean, like, this is, first of all, these newspapers shouldn't allow, be allowed to do that because that is, like, so hateful, you know. So they're encouraging hatred. They're encouraging people to just, like, feel that really, really destructive feeling of hate. But anyway, so, like, you read that, all right, you read a newspaper, like, where, like, Somebody's being demonized for doing what they absolutely had no choice but to do, okay? And I'm not saying we're not going to, like, separate, like, incarcerate, imprison people that are a danger to society or to themselves or whatever. You know, we have to maintain rule and order. But we can do that without the unnecessary and especially illogical hatred, okay? So anyway, so you you watch TV, you talk to others, and you kind of, like, you identify these situations, right? Next thing you do, you identify the hostile feelings that they evoke in you. You're, you're reading about this, this murder or whatever, this politician you don't like, wh- wh- whoever it is, and all of a sudden you're feeling angry at this person, okay? And, or it may be about a group of people, and you'll feel angry at a group of people. And that anger, you know, you may think, you know, some people enjoy feeling anger, but it's not a very healthy emotion. You know, they've demonstrated through decades of psychology of neuroscience that anger is destructive to the person who's feeling it. You know, they used to think, well, get it out and you'll feel better. No, <laughs> most often when you get it out, the more you get it out, the worse you feel and the more destruction becomes. All right, so you identify these hostile feelings, you know. And then, so what happens is like, you know, all right, so you, you, you identify the situation, identify the hostile feelings, and then the next thing is if you absolve the individual person, you say, you say to yourself, I understand this person had no choice but to do what they did. And let's say they did a crime. So it's very unfortunate for them. You know, they had, you know, they had no choice but to do what they did, but now they find themselves indicted and perhaps serving a long sentence for something that was absolutely n- not in their control. I mean, that, that's how wrong this is. So, all right, so like, so what happens you absolve the person, in your mind at least. Again, forget about what society is going to do because like, society is going to be, high, be behind in this for years, if not decades. So, all right, then you get in touch with the, the, the feeling of peace that you feel with the person. I mean, this is, we're, you know, basically what I'm advocating is what religion advocates, forgiveness. Okay, but in this case, there's nothing to forgive. In other words, you, you find that peace of mind, that lack of hostility toward the person by recognizing they did nothing wrong to begin with. In other words, like, the wrong they did, they had to do. It wasn't up to them. All right, so that, you know, in that case, you know, you might want to forgive God or the universe, but you don't have to forgive a person for something they absolutely had to do. It wasn't up to them. Okay, and so, like, so you get in touch with this peace, then you might want to get in touch with, like, alternative responses. You know, like, 
Well, you know, of compassion, you know, like, you know, somebody does something wrong, you feel bad, let's say they had a victim, whatever, so they did wrongs towards something, somebody, and a lot of times these wrongs have to do with blaming the person, so you can understand how free will, you know, belief actually causes a lot of crime. But, you know, so you feel bad for the victim, you feel bad for the, um, the person who did the crime, because, you know, if they're going to be punished, whatever. And then, you know, then you kind of like, you kind of realize that, like, you know, to the extent that the rest of society gets this, that these kinds of situations won't happen as much. Okay. And most fundamentally, you might want to ask why. You know, when you, when you ask why a person did whatever they did, you know, you'll, you'll come up with reasons. They were born to certain parents. They, they, they have cert, a certain genetic makeup. You know, there are certain genes that actually predispose people to certain behaviors. They, uh, they learned or didn't learn certain things. There's always reasons, there's always causes for why people do things. To the extent we know them, we become more compassionate. I'm running out of time. I got a little over a minute. So, like, you use this basic strategy, you know, again, not just for blame situations, but when you do wrong, you apply these same principles to yourself, and in time, in time, you'll get better at it. Okay, so, like, now envision a future where everybody understands that free will is an illusion. To the extent you do that well, you'll envision a future where there's far less blame, far, far less anger and hostility and guilt and envy and arrogance. It's going to be a much, much better world. And, you know, I can't say it'll happen because, like, you know, not having a free will, I can't say what, what I or the other people, you know, the rest of the world is going to do in the future, but it seems like it's destined to happen because that's... That's the way our world is moving. You know, people, more and more people are understanding this. All right. Well, I hope you understand why free will is an illusion, why the matter is important, and, you know, are getting a, a kind of like a, a beginning understanding of how to, how to put this knowledge into practice. All right. So this is George Ortega saying goodbye, and I will just, I'll be back to do, to do this as often as it takes so until you get this. Thanks.